Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, your source for travel stories, travel destinations, and travel philosophy. I'm Amanda. I'm Ryan. And we're your hosts. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Praxis. Praxis is the future of education, a real-world, self-directed education where you learn how to create value and learn real skills in the workplace. Praxis is a three-month boot camp followed by a six-month apprenticeship and an amazing community of young, inspiring people. A former guest on this show, Olivia Van Warmer, is actually a current Praxis participant. She's in month four of the program and has recently moved from Colorado out to San Francisco to start her apprenticeship. We reached out to Olivia and asked her what type of people should apply for Praxis. Who or what type of person do you think should consider applying for Praxis? Anyone who is who feels that there's like this itch when you think about, you know, doing the normal thing, going the, the college route or you're in college and you just feel like this slight itch that it's not quite right. Like there's something that is more that can push you to be better. I'd say anyone who has that understanding or who has felt like, you know, they could do more, that they can make more, that they can be more than they are at that exact moment. I think anyone like that is a perfect candidate. So if you've felt that same itch, if you've thought there must be something more than this conventional education, there must be something more than this conventional career, go to discoverpraxis.com, schedule a call, and find out if the program is right for you. What's up, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the World Wanderers podcast. Today, we are very excited to have a conversation with two fellow nomads, Sasha and Rachel from the Grateful Gypsies. Um, Sasha and Rachel actually have an incredible backstory, and we get into it in this episode, but they've done some really exciting and interesting things in the past. Um, they've kind of built their nomadic life teaching English, and that's taken them from China to Mexico with stops in Indonesia and some other places in between. So we kind of dig into the details of teaching English and just how they got from living kind of on a conventional track to where they are today. So if you're interested in teaching English as a way to get out and travel more, you'll find a lot of practical value in this episode. But if you're just generally interested in non-conventional life and living abroad, yeah, I think you'll really enjoy this as well. Definitely. And so just before we dig into the meat and potatoes, one might say, of this episode, uh, just a quick announcement. We are launching our free online series of Hangouts with ourselves and our community and some special guests. So those are going to kickstart on Tuesday, June 6th at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Sorry, European friends. Uh, we will do a hangout that you guys can join for. Um, but for now, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All of the information is up on our Facebook page at the World Wanderers Podcast. And something that's really exciting is our first one on June 6th is going to be a Q&A travel discussion topic. And and then June 13th, our next one, Sasha and Rachel are actually going to be joining us live to answer all your questions about teaching English, both in countries and online. So if you've been thinking about that might be a good way for you to make money on the road or something that you're thinking about doing in the future or have just been curious about what that experience is like, definitely join us. All the events are free and all the information is up on our Facebook page. All right. So that's enough chatting from us. Without further ado, here's Sasha and Rachel. We're excited to be joined on the podcast today by Sasha and Rachel, who are joining us all the way from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, so on the complete opposite side of the world from us here in Taiwan. Uh, Sasha and Rachel, welcome to the show. We're really excited to be chatting with you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, guys. I've been looking forward to it, so thanks for having us on. Yeah, and I think that I, I know you guys are doing really cool stuff in Mexico right now, and we definitely want to hear about that because Mexico is on our radar for the fall. But I think a good place to start is to back up. You guys have been traveling for, I think, like 10 years almost, you said? Yeah, it's coming on 10 years. Um, I guess we could probably just start from where we met, which was kind of right before my, my big travel journey started. So... Um, we actually met while working at a music festival in uh, in Michigan, in my home state, and you know fell in love with the with the live music and had a 
you know, a very uh, romantic experience. And then I moved to China a month later, so. <laughs> <laughs> Get slightly less romantic. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had already uh, planned to move to Beijing to teach English before we met. And, uh, you know, classic case of bad timing, I guess. Right, Rachel? Yes, terrible timing. <laughs> at, well, at the same time, it wasn't such terrible timing. The only bad thing about it was that Sasha was going to the other side of the world. Other than that, we had both just graduated college and had literally no idea what we wanted to do with ourselves. At least I had no idea what I wanted to do with myself. Um so in that sense, we were just open to any and all possibilities. Hence the moving to China. <laughs> <laughs> so did you move to China as well, Rachel? Or did you guys just kind of not see each other for a while? It was about um, 10 months that I was there by myself. Yeah, so Sasha was there for 10 months by himself. And we were just keeping in touch uh, you know, through email and Facebook and whatnot. And then he said that the only thing that would bring him back from China early was if a certain band got back together. Uh, that band is called Fish. Fish with a P. With a PH, right. And they announced that they were getting back together while he was in China. So he, um, we bought all these tickets and I initially thought, oh, maybe we'll just go to like one or two concerts. Uh, long story short, in that calendar year, we ended up going to 20 concerts together. I think um, 20 shows in 10 states was the final tally. Yeah. So that was a pretty big year. A lot of road music. tripping. Yeah. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, so <laughs> you'll, you'll quickly find that a lot of our travel is heavily related to live music, whether it's following fish around or working at music festivals or going to... We've actually been to... An, festival at an all-inclusive resort here in Mexico a few years ago, which was a pretty awesome way to combine our loves, you know, travel and live music. And so that's kind of been the start of, of the travel bug for both of us probably is following to see our favorite bands around. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that costs money and uh, jobs were not easy to find at the end of 2009 when we were looking for them. So Finally, Rachel got to a point where she said, well, you seem to have had a pretty good time in Beijing. And if you think I can get work, too, pretty quickly, screw it. Let's let's go for it. I'm ready to take the move, uh, the plunge as well. So, Well, we were also pretty down and out at the time, just not being able to find jobs. And we were even on food stamps. I had to work for free in a restaurant for like two weeks just to be offered like a waitressing position. Thanks, Obama. <laughs> <laughs> Save that for another, a different podcast. <laughs> uh, we like that, 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 that kid around with Obama vibe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what was that first experience like working and living in Beijing? Uh, like, well, that was just me, so I'll field that one. Um, I went over with the program that was going to get you a job teaching as well as provide the apartment and... and offer some Chinese lessons, and a nice little community of other teachers. So it sounds great, right? Of course, it sounds good, too good to be true. It probably is. And turns out that the company we're all working for is just kind of giving us the shaft. Bad hours, bad pay, bad apartment, bad location. And we all quickly caught on and kind of demanded a change or we were all going to leave. They didn't take us seriously. So I think 11 out of 13 of us did, in fact, leave the program. Um, not too long into it. So wow. It was almost a disaster. I mean, I really didn't have much money. I didn't speak much Chinese. I didn't have any connections. And the situation was just that bad. I wanted out. But uh, some of the other guys were really nice in offering that, you know, lend me money and move in together so that we could all get out of the program and find our own jobs. And that kept me around. And I found a much better situation and started learning Chinese and started traveling and you know, next thing you know, it's time, it's time to fly, fly home. The round trip ticket has come uh, to confront you. And it went by real fast. So I really was not ready to be done with it. I actually kind of left a lot of things there. Just figured I'd be back sooner than later. But that's when Rachel and I started dating and got you know serious and tried to live together and look for jobs and all that. So it kind of got delayed a little too much for me to move back. But it did happen. And she came along for round two. So it was worth the wait. And did you guys go to Beijing the second time? Yeah. Yeah. When I went, we just went right back to Beijing because 
Um, Sasha's, uh, a lot of Sasha's friends were still there and he had some connections. So getting set up there was a lot easier than it probably would have been otherwise. And I left a bunch of my crap there. So I kind of had to go back and <laughs> get it. There wasn't much, just some clothes and books and DVDs or whatever. But, you know, we, I did know people there. I was actually able to go back to my old job after some poking around because they had moved and I didn't have anybody's number and, in the end, I did end up back at my old job. Rachel was able to take on a pretty cushy gig to get her feet wet in China. I'll let her talk real quick about that one. Oh, I was just a glorified babysitter. Um, through like <laughs> expat website of like for one of them for Beijing where you can find apartments and jobs and all that stuff. Um, I found a job being an English teacher for two little girls who were sisters. Um, who went to an American school in the suburbs of Beijing, and their driver would just pick me up from my downtown apartment four days a week and take me out to their house. Their mansion. Their mansion. It had an elevator. (laughs) (laughs) This isn't Beijing. That's crazy. Most people live in big high-rise apartments, you know, stacked on top of each other. These these, these people were super rich. They lived in an actual house that had an elevator in it. Um, But, yeah, anyway, I would uh, hang out there. They would even feed me dinner four days a week. And I think it was more just to give their regular nanny a break (laughs) and get some English at the same time. Right. Yeah. Wow. That's such an interesting experience to have had. That's really different from what I would imagine like Beijing being like, we've only been to Shanghai before. So I'm actually curious, like what was life like in Beijing? Because I found that Shanghai was a little bit, I don't know, it, it wasn't challenging in the terms of like developing country challenging. It was kind of right. challenging in the idea of you don't have all your comforts from home as much as you do in a lot of other countries. Sure. Well, and they're just massive, overwhelmingly, you know, crowded and crazy cities, right? Both of them. So that, that definitely is, is an element to life in either of them. I would say life moves very quickly there. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, it, it was definitely a very challenging, place to live just you know like you said you don't have a lot of comforts from home Uh, you're on the complete opposite side of the world and and so the the culture is also you know very opposite from what you're used to and it's definitely a lot to get used to and it's and it's not for everyone but um although we did find that a lot of the comforts that we're missing from home gradually also appeared in Beijing over our years I mean I'll just do one quick example. When I, I'm a big craft beer guy. I like, I like to have a pale ale, a porter, a stout, whatever. You know, I like to, to try different beers. And when I first got to China, you would get excited about finding a Budweiser. Like, that was big news. There was no, no such thing as craft beer or good beer in China. By the time we left Beijing, I think there was a, the fourth craft brewery opening up in the city. So it just changed real quick. We saw quick. it change a lot yeah. over the course of time we were there. And the longer we stayed, the more comfortable it got. Okay. And did you guys just kind of, did you guys use VPNs to use Facebook and stuff? Or did you just kind of like get rid of social media? Well, my first year there, that stuff hadn't been blocked yet. So that was something I had to deal with going back, uh, you know, when China decided you couldn't get on Facebook and YouTube and stuff. So yeah, we, we always paid for Astral. Oh, wow. Astral VPN, I think is what we used. It was always like 60 bucks a month. And um, I had to go on YouTube and WordPress and uh, Facebook for work. So I had to pay for it, but it was also a tax write-off. So, I mean, it was one of those things that, yeah, you just dealt with it. You know, there was there was an easy uh, solution to the problem of the, of the Great Firewall of China, as they call it. <laughs> <laughs> and what kept you guys in China? Because you, you ended up living there for five years. Is that right? Well, if you count my first year there, so I guess through all my stints i was there almost 6 and rachel was close to 5 total but we were in and out so that's important for people to to know that that was probably what kept us there was being able to leave multiple times you can just go we through did a, lot quick, of traveling. a few of the trips uh, we went to mexico for that music festival that sasha mentioned we did our first backpacking trip in thailand and laos for a month uh we went to bali for 2 weeks in 2012, we took about eight or nine like short trips for like two weeks at a time. So I guess that was a big part of it. You know, we were able to kind of craft that that lifestyle where it wasn't so hard to take four days off here and there to do trips in China and then get 
10 to 12 off to go to Bali, Japan, Mexico. We, had, we went to a lot of cool places. We also had really cool jobs that um, gave us a decent amount of flexibility. Sure. So that, that was a big part of it. You know, yeah. as you guys said before we started the interview, it's hard to, uh, you know, move around so much. You get settled in and then you got to, as soon as you move, you got to do it all over again. So we, we had our spot in Beijing, nice apartment, knew where everything was, could find work, and we could also get out and travel a lot. So was it com- compared to your peers who were over there um, teaching English and other in other jobs? Were you guys traveling a lot more? Were you guys kind of exceptional in the amount you were traveling? Because we've talked to a few people who've done English teaching in Asia, and they they tend to have stories of more like, oh, I was planning to travel, but I ended up just like not having much vacation time, and I just kind of got stuck, and I didn't actually go to all these other places. Uh, I think that all that depends on which country you're in, what job you end up in, and just what kind of person you are. Specifically, I mean, we are very gung ho about travel, so we would actively try to, you know, switch classes with other teachers to get an extra day off this week, or, you know, very strategically use vacation days around the Chinese holidays. I mean, we were actively seeking out ways to get those travel experiences in, where I do think a lot of people will just kind of get into their, you know, routine and then maybe that involves partying on the weekends and stuff like that. And, you know, one week just kind of goes to the next. And when you're not planning travel or requesting the days off or booking tickets, you're not going to go, especially in China where you're always worried about train tickets selling out. And I think it also depends on the kind of job you have. Um, We were working in a training center where we were all the classes were the same they were all taught in the same way. So you could switch out the teacher. It didn't really matter which teacher was doing it as long as the teacher was, was, was there. But I think if you're working in an actual school, you know, like a, an elementary school, a middle school, you're not, not, it's not going to be as easy for you because you're going to be responsible for your class of students and you're going to be limited to um, the Chinese holidays and summer and winter vacation. So, it, yeah, it depends on a lot of factors. And, like, my brother just got to Seoul, and he previously taught in Beijing. He's transitioning into working in Korea now. And last I talked to him, he's not really planning much for travel this year because he just isn't getting a lot of holidays at his new job in Korea. He's going to travel around Korea and maybe take a trip to Japan, but nothing, you know, big, no flights across the world, no backpacking trips. So really depends on what situation you get into and what kind of, you know, person you are and how hard you want to work to get those, those days off really. Yeah, definitely. We have uh, two good friends who are, they're um, not just English teachers. They're like, they teach at an international school, um, teaching the Canadian curriculum at a school in Macau. And we, we had the chance to see them, uh, was that last year? Yeah, I guess 2016 in the fall when we first got to Asia. And it's really interesting to see like their life is very much set up in Macau. They have a place, like they have a routine there. And then each of their breaks, they go somewhere else. Yeah. Somewhere else that's kind of like cool or exciting in Asia. And I was just thinking about how that lifestyle is. I think it like works for some people, but then it doesn't work for other people. But it's definitely... I don't know. It's cool to kind of have a job that pays you well, that you feel excited about, that you can be like busy and consumed with, and then take these opportunities to go to places that are, you know, cooler than you might be able to go to in at home. I was going to say like, I'm from Alberta. So it's like better than going to like Saskatoon or something like that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. yeah, Right. And I mean, just a lot of people we know just in the U S certainly don't get that much time off. And when they do get that time off, they probably aren't going to Bali or Japan or Thailand. I mean, few people, sure. But, you know, that that's something that we were able to do because of our location and our, and our jobs and the flexibility that both allowed us to do those things. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. And I don't know if you guys have like a, a direct answer to this, but I feel like for a lot of people who have kind of entered into this nomadic lifestyle, there's there seems to be a point where you're like, you go from, okay, I'm on this trip, this is sort of temporary, I'm going to go back home, to, okay, I'm actually not going to go back home. Uh, so I guess two-part question, one, did you guys have that? And two, if you did, at what point did that happen? That's a good question. That's a really good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> well... Okay, so I knew that I always wanted to travel, um, 
And so when I moved to China, maybe on the surface, I was kind of like, yeah, I'm just going to go for like a year and see how it works out. But underneath it all, I like was hoping that I would love it and that I wouldn't really want to go back. So for me, upon arrival in China, it was pretty immediate. Like for all of the challenges that living in China presented me, it was also so much fun. Like I have such the biggest like love hate relationship with China because it, I had like the greatest moments of joy and at the same time the greatest moments of just depths of despair <laughs> in China. Sometimes in the same week, even yeah. so, sometimes in the same night. If it was a really good night. <laughs> so I, for me, it was like. <laughs> pretty immediately that I knew that I just didn't want to go back home. But you also were saying right away that you knew it was going to be more than a year because you wouldn't do everything you wanted to do. You wouldn't well, speak Chinese very okay. well. well. You so wouldn't like, be settled. To my family and friends, I was kind of just like, yeah, a year. But, you know, to myself and, <laughs> and you, I was like, okay, we can go back Yeah. And I mean, I guess after the my second round in China, where, where it was Rachel's first, and it ended up being a long one. We were there three and a half years together. Um, again, in, in stints, we came in and out traveling and stuff. Our life was there. We were based there. We changed jobs and apartments, sure, but we were, you know, Beijing was home for all that time. But when did you know that you didn't want to go back home? Well, I was going to say once we did our, our gap year trip. So when, when we decided to move out of Beijing, we, you know, we'd heard so much about these gap years that all the kids take. So we wanted to take one just, you know, a couple of years later than, than most who you meet on the road in Southeast Asia. So we uh, we went ahead and did that, and you know once that got going, I mean really, the trying to find you know put an end to that feeling to that adventure, you just realized you weren't going to want to do that. You know you wanted this to be to continue, and maybe it couldn't be nonstop travel, so you got to find another thing to settle into for a little bit, and that's kind of been our, I guess our plan in the last few years is stay somewhere for a while. Not as long as we were in Beijing, but get to know a place and use it as an opportunity to learn a language or learn about the culture um, or both, ideally, and travel around that country or that region. You know, so that's what we've done since we moved out of Beijing, really. Yeah, that's awesome. And then it, it was it at that point that you guys decided to go to Bali and learn Indonesian for a year? Yeah. Uh, well, so we did the gap year, and then we went back to China to take on teaching jobs again, but this time in Kunming, which Rachel chose, so she can say a quick word about Kunming. It's a city in southwest China. It's the capital of Yunnan province, and it borders Laos uh, and Vietnam. And Myanmar. And Myanmar. So it has more of a Southeast Asian vibe than a Chinese vibe, and it's a, it's a lot different than Beijing, so it's still China, but you're getting a different side of China. We called it the concrete village because it's like a big city, but it still, still feels like a village. But our friend had done this program in Bali before. That was the whole reason we went to Bali the first time in 2012 was to visit our friend who was doing this Indonesian program. And um, it was honestly that trip where Sasha uh, came up with the idea to do our gap year. So Bali's True. always been kind of special, and he always wanted to get back there to do that program. So when we finally finished our gap year and settled into Kunming for a year, we didn't have any future plans right. <clears throat> preventing us from doing it. So he just said, you know, I'll just do it now. Why not? And applied and got in. And so that was what... That dictated our next move for us. But like, yeah, like Rachel said, I, I, you know, Bali, everybody's got that story of falling in love with Bali and never wanting to leave. And it's so cliched, but it did totally happen to us. And it wasn't just Bali. It was, it was, a, you know, I just had a really strong feeling that I didn't see enough of the place. I didn't dive as deep as I wanted to. And I had to go back to Beijing and just go back to work. And it was a real drag on me. And I paid all this money for this flight. And here I was. And there's so much more to see and experience in Bali, but yet I have to go home tomorrow, you know, because I got a job to show up to. So it was really a motivating factor to try to find a way to work more on your own terms and set your own schedule. And hey, if you do get the chance to live in Bali, to take it and go do it and not feel like anything's holding you back. So it really kind of pushed us in a new direction. And I had it in the back of my mind to apply for that program for years. Finally, it made sense. And we thought I was a shoe in so it was we were pretty much planning on it as soon as I applied. 
So I want to talk more about the the Indonesian program, but before we move away from teaching English in China, um, if if there's someone out there who's listening who's kind of thought about, oh, maybe it would be cool to go get an English teaching job in China. Um, I know you guys had the one experience, or or you did Sasha with the Shifty Company. What would be some tips for someone who's thinking about doing that to get started and to to do it in a way that avoids sketchiness? Sure, uh, that's that's an awesome question, and that's that's a, one of the biggest things we try to do through our site and just our online presence, I guess, is give good information about teaching in China because there's a lot of bad info, and people do get in a lot of shifty programs like I was in, it's, it's a very common occurrence. So what I always tell people really is if, if you think you might be interested in it, you know, taking an online TEFL course is not a terrible idea. They're pretty reasonably priced, don't take a lot of time or effort, and then you'll at least have more certifications, more qualifications if you do want to do it. Um, and that kind of gives you an idea as to what teaching English is like. You know, this is going to be your job. Are you going to hate it? And you might not want to do it just because of that. Uh, and then beyond that, I, I always say go to China, get a tourist visa and go to China, but go to a place where you think you could see yourself living and working. So have a list of maybe only one or two, maybe three cities you could potentially visit. But instead of just being a tourist, you're kind of renting an Airbnb, which is possible these days. It wasn't for me when I started. Um, you have your resume, you have your TEFL certificate, you're, you're actually going out and interviewing in person. And this way you can avoid a lot of the shifty middlemen who get you to sign up and give them money before you even get to China. If anybody asks you for money other than paying for a TEFL, you know, which is an actual tangible thing you should get, I, I would say run away. Like you shouldn't have to pay to join a program to go teach in China. You can find a job on your own. How quickly, Rachel? I mean, uh, pretty fast. But at the same time, if someone doesn't have the capabilities to just go to China and check it out, they want to have something set up first. I would I would say do some research and figure out where you might want to live. Yeah. Because, you know, as you mentioned, like you've only been to Shanghai and Shanghai can be quite different from Beijing. So not all cities in China are created equal. So it's a good idea to do a bit of research about where you think you might want to live. Right. And then try and seek out the sort of expat websites for that particular city. If it's a big city with a lot of expats, they definitely have one. That's a great and example. The Beijinger.com for Beijing, uh, Go Kunming for Kunming. Every big Chinese city has an English language site with classified ads and blog posts and stuff. And you can get a feel for what kind of jobs are out there, how much apartments cost, what kind of events are going on. You can post in forums and you can get you know more. Right. You can ask questions. You mm. can ask questions about <clears throat> schools or companies. You. Sorry, <clears throat> you may have gotten offers from and um, just see like what people on the ground have to say about it. But I'd say still ideally, if you can just go and visit and but try to be looking at apartments and looking at jobs and hopefully you're thinking I'm going to stay right. Um, you're, you should be pretty sold on it by that point. But the, I mean, there's nothing beats an on the ground in person interview. You can't see a school from Skype. You can't really get get the vibe of a place through a Skype interview. So it is very possible to get on the ground on a tourist visa, go to a bunch of interviews, nail a job down, take a quick trip to Hong Kong, change to a working visa and come back. And a lot of schools will pay for that trip to Hong Kong because they'll really want to get you on board if you've already shown that initiative by showing up on their doorstep. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. That's yeah, that's really good advice. I think, um, especially right now, you can fly to China for a very affordable flight. I think when we were coming over to Asia, there was one uh, China Eastern flight that was like three hundred dollars. Um, so making that small upfront investment to make sure you don't get in a bad situation later is is really really smart. Def I mean, definitely. And, and having money saved, you know, so you're not scrambling to get on your feet is, is absolutely ideal. If you can go over there and potentially be able to get yourself through through a month or two, um, that's that's awesome. And you'll you should be set up within that time. And like I said, if you did your research and you know some places you might want to work and, you know, a very short list of cities you might want to live and you've looked into the forums and. You've, you've done as much as you could without being there, then once you get there, you can really hit the ground running. And this isn't the best example, because when we moved to Kunming, it was our second time there. We had visited before, and we had obviously already lived in China. But we got our apartment through Go Kunming 
from the road in Southeast Asia. We found the apartment, worked out the deal with the guy, planned it out without even seeing it um, in person. And then after being on the ground for, I'd say, a week, Rachel was gainfully employed. So, uh, again, we were already kind of China veterans, but that kind of situation is very possible even if you're a total beginner. It's especially true for native English speakers. You know, if you're not a native English speaker, it's very possible to get work. And we have lots of friends who aren't native English speakers who have had great English teaching jobs in China. But you do have a few more hurdles. It's not quite as easy as if you're American, Canadian, British, Australian, etc. So how did Kunming, uh, did, did you guys like living there? I've heard a couple good things about it as a city compared to other places in China. I liked it a lot. Um, it's a lot smaller. I mean, it's still a city of 6 million people, but that compared to Beijing's 25 million is, is small. It feels small. Um, the, the expat community is really tight knit because, uh, there's because just, small. right. Because it's small. There's just less of them. So everyone knows everyone. And there's only a couple of places that people go to on a regular basis in, in the city. And so it just, it, you have a much stronger sense of, Community, of a community feeling, which and is even, nice. Even the locals, just the Chinese people in Kunming are way more relaxed and easygoing and friendly than people in Beijing. So they make a world of difference too, I'd say. Yeah, they, they come and, and hang out with the expat community. So it's a really nice, strong mix of both expats and locals. It's kind of like the difference between like New York City and like a small town in Colorado. Because, you know, New York's like cold and crowded <laughs> and expensive and people are rude and they, you know, push you out of the way. And then, you know, that's kind of like Beijing. And then you get down to Kunming and it's up in the mountains. And... People move a lot slower. They were way more relaxed. They're, they seem much happier. The weather's better. The weather's way better. Um, There's way less uh, air pollution because it's not nearly as industrial as the north. Um, the air gets a little dusty sometimes, but that's just because of construction. Um, it's actually at 2,000 meters in elevation above sea level. Uh, so it's a spring city. It's never too hot and never too cold. Uh, so the it's a very temperate place. So it's nice. And I, I totally would have lived there another year. But um, as my dad said, and I should try to say it in my dad's very Russian accent, he said, well, when, when you get invited to live in paradise for a year, you, you don't say no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I... I couldn't say no to Bali to stay one more year in Kunming, you know? So we, we definitely have a fun yeah. in our heart for Kunming and it would have been a place we had stayed longer. It just, it was time to move because of an opportunity, you know, and you got to take those, I think. I would go back. I would totally go back. Okay. Yeah. That's great to hear. And then, um, yeah, uh, on the terms of what you were saying about Bali before, I think that we can both relate to that feeling of like falling in love with Bali. I know for me, I did my yoga teacher training there uh, two years ago and I wasn't going to go to Bali because I felt like it was so cliche, like, oh, I'm going like, to travel from Canada and go do my yoga teacher training for a month. And then I was like, screw and it, I'm just going to do it love. anyways. And I had, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I'd already read Eat, Pray, Love by that point. So I was like, oh no, I'm like living this. Um, <laughs> minus the like divorce and right affair and all of that stuff of course but yeah I went there and just I was like this is why it becomes a cliche like I totally understand it and I love it so much there that I'm just okay with being a part of that <laughs> yep you get there and you're like yep I'm okay with this <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, I'm totally okay with it it's it's fine with me people like wasn't it a really touristy place I'd say sure some of it some of uh, Bali is really touristy place you I've should had, go there I've had <laughs> friends recently who have been planning trips to Indonesia like come to ask me for advice and then they're like should we go to Bali I mean really it's like really touristy right and I'm like yes you should absolutely yeah. go to Bali like there's a reason it's touristy and who knows when you're going to be in that part of the world again you should just go don't go to this part of Bali, go to this part yeah, of Bali, and you'll love it. It's not about skipping the island, it's about what part of the island you skip. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So where were you guys based for a year? Uh, yeah, and what, what were the details of the of the program? Sure, I'll, I'll go through that real quick. So the program is called Dharma Siswa, and it's actually through the government of Indonesia. It's uh, basically their way of getting Indonesian language and culture spread around the world. They run this program every year and I think the total is 750 or 800 people from like 
70 or 80 countries come to Indonesia to study for a year. And the schools are all mostly in Sumatra, Java, and Bali, the three you know, most populous islands. So you can study Indonesian language. Um, you can study music. You can study dance. Uh, those are the most common courses in it. So what it basically is is just a scholarship program. They bring you over there. You get free tuition. You're in this program for a full you know, school year at a local university. You get your residence permit so you don't have to worry about visas and visa runs and all that. And you get a stipend that's pretty small but helps pay for your, your rent, basically. And they want you to invite your family and friends and tell everybody about it, you know, and uh, bring your, your knowledge of Indonesia home with you. So that's kind of their way of doing that. And it's, I think it's pretty awesome. And I was looking forward to trying to join it, like we said earlier. So when, when it was finally, when we were finally at a point where I knew I could do the year without any worries, I said, now is the time to apply. And I had a feeling I would get in, so I did. <laughs> it was I, I was already running an Indonesian language and culture blog, so I don't think they had any other applicants who could have said that, you know, that they were already involved in the language. So, yeah. How did you get How did you get interested in Indonesian? Well, we went to Bali that that one time, and honestly, when we booked that trip, I don't think either of us even knew Bali was in Indonesia. Typical yeah. American. <laughs> Be honest. I started looking it up. I was like, I want to go to Bali, and I started like looking it up, and I was like, Oh, it's in Indonesia. Oh, Who it's knew? not a country. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're we're great at geography in the U.S. as everybody knows. <laughs> um, but uh, we, yeah, we had traveled there and just kind of did the tourist thing. You know, visited my buddy and hung out in Kuda and went to Ubud and went to Uluwatu and just typical first Bali trip. Lots of bintangs, um, but. You know, just from interacting with, with people on a daily basis, we picked up the small, you know, pleasantries. The language compared to Chinese was so easy. And the it's people, a pretty simple language. And the people were so nice. I mean, it was just a nice change of pace from Beijing. So we just had that interest in Indonesia. We knew we wanted to go back. So why don't you tell about our gap year trip through Indonesia? Well, we went, when, we, when we did our full gap year, our last place was, our last country was Indonesia. And we spent a full 45 days um, traveling across Indonesia all over land. So we flew into Jakarta from Kuala Lumpur and then just made our way all the way across Java, all the way across Bali to Lombok over land. And that's where land we... Land and sea. It is, <laughs> it is an sea. archipelago. Did I say that right? <laughs> Never did but we spent 45 <laughs> days there. <laughs> we spent 45 days there, which was the longest we spent in any of the countries on our gap year trip uh, thailand nudged it out by a little bit but yeah it was up there and uh prior to that trip the company that i had been blogging uh for about chinese language and culture had expressed interest in starting an indonesian page they said hey we can't leave out the fourth most populous country in the world you know we're a language company so i guess that we kind of were able to connect the dots there they said if you're going to go there and spend some quality time on the ground and are willing to pick up some of the language and take your cameras and some stories, let's launch this thing and let's let's start an Indonesian page. So there was some motivation, you know, for, for my job as well to go take an Indonesian class and spend some more time in the country and not do it all in Bali. So that was why we, we went back for so long during our gap year. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing experience. And so can you tell us a little bit about what your like day-to-day -day life was while you were doing this language program? Yeah, uh, it depends on the semester, I guess. The fall semester started off a little more seriously, I guess. And most, uh, most of the uh, people in the program were actually showing up to class, teachers included. And we were, <laughs> you know, we were doing the class for... We, we were doing the class for, I guess, three hours or four hours in the morning, and we'd get some simple homework assignments, and that was it. So you had the rest of the day free, and uh, I was on the older side of my class, so a lot of my classmates were going straight to the beach to surf and spend most of their day doing that until it was time, bin-tang time, as we like to say. Um, but 
Uh, I was more into kind of like I would go to class, then go to the gym, then do some blog work, hang out by the pool, go to the beach. Not really a surfer, so I would just kind of chill, maybe take a bike ride or a jog or get a boogie board. We did a lot of boogie boogie boarding. Yeah. (laughs) And then, you know, on the weekends, you would try to get on your scooter and go up to Ubud for a festival or go down to the Bukit Peninsula to find some secret beach or we went to a water buffalo race up in the northwest. That was pretty rowdy. I went to a cremation ceremony in my teacher's <laughs> village. I mean, you know, the class was was a small snippet, really. Um, a lot of people aren't taking it that seriously. It's it's more of kind of a, a base and just an excuse to have you there. But for the most part, I feel like a lot of people in the program kind of have to kind of sculpt it themselves, you know, make their own experience, whether that's getting out there and actually speaking Indonesian a lot and learning as you go, or a lot of people who studied music found their school to be kind of lacking. So they actually went and started a group and hired their own teacher and met at his house. And, you know, so they ended up paying for instruction, but they just weren't getting much out of the free ones. So. But then they were playing for actual ceremonies right. in and around Bali. But then they got so much out of it. They were, you know, dressed in the traditional garb, playing gamelan music in weddings, cremation ceremonies, holidays. So really, it's kind of up to you. Um, it's very, very much a choose-your-own-adventure kind of program, I guess. You get out what you put in. Yeah. You can hear the fireworks in the background now. Yeah. There you go. Yes. That <laughs> disclaimer, Those are fireworks. <laughs> disclaimer for the listeners, Mexico is just a noisy place. We do not know why our neighborhood has been lighting up fireworks for a week, but they have been. So. It's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a really great experience that you had there and just, you know, from our two months there, I feel like spending a year there, you'd be able to dive so deep into the culture and, you know, the language and just everything that that tiny, amazing island has to offer. Absolutely. And I guess I should mention one more thing about it, just in terms of like what you get out of the program. I kind of found the, the classes to be a little lacking, to be honest. I'm picky. I'm, I'm an English teacher. I've had really good Chinese teachers, you know, so I kind of expect something out of a language class a little more professionalism or just seriousness all around. And you just weren't really getting that there. Um, So you could just write it off and say, forget it. I'm just going to surf. I'm just going to hang out. I'm just going to eat, pray, love. Or you can (laughs) try to get that on your own. So we ended up moving into a house for three months in a village where certainly there are no tourists, um, no tourism infrastructure, no bars, no, you know, burger or pizza joints. It was really... Life in a Balinese village, farming, uh, running little little roadside shops, fixing motorbikes, a local beach with a temple. It was very simple, and every time we went out, we'd have to speak Indonesian, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody spoke English, so you can find that kind of experience in Bali, and then even if the class isn't giving you a lot, you're getting the Balinese experience, and you're learning Indonesian, so... We got invited to a full moon ceremony on Christmas Day. Yeah. That was really cool because um, foreigners can only go in the temples if they're invited by a local. Um, and it just so happened that um, there was a full moon on Christmas Day when we were there. And we were living in the village at the time. So um, our neighbors invited us to go to the full moon ceremony that night. So that was a really cool experience. It being, you know, the West's most important holiday and then going to one of the more special ceremonies of the Hindu culture. But you're not just going to find that in Bali. You really have, you know, you have to to make a move like we did. You have to kind of escape from the Boule zone, I guess we would call it, (laughs) Uh, which is very easy to be in and nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's an amazing from surfing in Changu or, you know, yoga in Ubud or cheeseburgers or just, just partying in Cuda, Mike. <laughs> just partying in Cuda. <laughs> you can have that too. You do want to get that, you know, if it's you, got the best of both worlds. It does. And you can't write Bali off as being too touristy because there's still, still 4 million Balinese people who aren't tourists, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like an amazing experience to have had. So by the time you guys got to the end of, well, I guess first question, Rachel, were you um, were you working while you were in Bali or were you also in the program? What were you doing during that year? No. Um, 
So Island housewife. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, we 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 had our money saved for our gap year, and at the end of our gap year, we saved just enough to get ourselves set up in Kunming. So we got to Kunming, paid six months rent because that's just how they do things there, and then we were broke. But like Sasha said, I had a job within a week. Uh, so we just hunkered down for the year and, um, I just worked and, uh, saved and didn't really do a whole, whole lot. We actually, then we got married. <laughs> People throw money at you when you get married. So that helped. That helped. Yeah. Um, we got married in the summer of 2015 and then that fall was when Sasha started the program. So we kind of just looked at it as like an extended honeymoon almost. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I would... I would go to the beach. I would hang out with the neighbors. I would um, go to the gym. Go to the, the gym. gym I would go to yoga classes. I did a lot of yoga. We actually volunteered at the Bali Spirit Festival, with, which is a yoga and music festival. Um, I worked on our website a lot. I put a lot of time and effort into that because up until that point, I hadn't really had a whole lot of time to put into it. When she was a tour guide, we, we counted, I think in five years in China, we had like two or three visitors if you count my brothers um no and, one came to see us and in then china. in nine months in bali we had about 28 visitors yeah so. yeah, we had a lot of visitors. So I, I spent, yeah it was great all of a sudden everybody wanted to visit us right. I, I don't know why yeah, yeah. time and timing just worked out better wow. <laughs> yeah exactly it's just the right time so i spent a lot of time uh playing tour guide as well so that was nice Nobody dreams about a vacation to Beijing. Like, right. Don't hear that. <laughs> right. Yeah. I was offered a position with English First. They have a center there in uh, Denpasar, the capital of Bali. Um, but just like the pay was below your level. <laughs> it, say that. It was, it's below her level. It was not very much. Uh, and I really just wanted the time to devote to all of our visitors that were coming. So, uh, but the possibility is there t to teach. Sure, you can you can work in Bali. It's not an easy place to find work as a boule as a foreigner. But if you poke around, if you're really dedicated, that that is an option. I don't know. Rachel was like she said, you know, when you can have an extended honeymoon and just live, you know, very frugally. You know, there weren't a lot of very fabulous uh, nights out in Bali. We would opt for night markets and bintangs on the beach and hey what's wrong with that right i mean that's it's a pretty awesome uh, <laughs> awesome night so we were able to do it without having to worry about work yeah yeah sorry i was just going to say it's it's amazing to you how cheap you can live if you kind of like put your head down and just budget when you're in bali like it's so affordable to live there yeah i'd, I'd say most i'd say most months between the two of us we we always probably spent under two grand u s and probably a lot of times even fifteen hundred or less for the two of us for everything so yeah definitely that's yeah yeah that's way less than you would spend in any north american city right. for sure less than my friends paying rent in Denver, you know, rent alone. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And so after that year was up, where did you guys go to next? Fish tour. We went back, <laughs> we went back to the U.S. You've probably noticed a trend here now to go see a bunch of concerts and uh, do a few music festivals. We, we met at a festival and we both, you know, that was a huge part of our college years. And just, you know, so we met a lot of friends was going to festivals. So we we planned, always missed them. We planned a big summer around seeing music in a lot of different places. Um, so we went back to America just before Memorial Day, and then we went to a couple of music festivals, several fish shows in Chicago, in Denver, in Vegas. Up at the Gorge in Washington, which yeah. is the best music venue in the United States, <laughs> hands down. Yep. I will argue this with anybody. Red, Red, Red Rocks is a close number two, and we also went there last year. So we were... We were just bouncing around the U.S. visiting friends and family. We spent a lot of time with our families, which we hadn't been able to do previously. We were always in and out for just like a week or two at a time. And this time we got to spend a few months. So that was really nice. Yeah, we should mention at this point that um, Rachel started teaching English online for a Chinese company. So between her online teaching and my blogging, we were working everywhere we were. We were getting a paycheck every month, but we were able to you know, bounce around the U.S. and do extended visits with people and see fish a bunch and do the things that we like to do. So um, that's what we did for most of the year after we got, well, yeah, the rest of the year after we left Bali. 
Had you been, after living in China, being in Asia for so long, living in Indonesia, had you been craving being back in the U.S. and kind of the developed world? I, yes, a little bit. <laughs> yes, but not for as long as we ended up staying. You know, we didn't really think we were going to be home for seven months. It just kind of worked out that way. It just kind of happened, but that was nice. Like, when we when we left Bali to go back home, when we made these grand summer plans, we left it open-ended we we didn't make an america like an america exit strategy like right. we didn't know we, where we were going to go next or when and then <laughs> we had all our stuff at my parents house and her mom's attic just kind of like scattered we were just you know on the road so but i think that was honestly like the best way to approach it because we had this amazing time in america and i got to reconnect with a lot of like friends that i hadn't really seen so much in previous years because you know, we were never able to go to America for that long at a time. and um, it, it was nice to be on for 4th of July, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. I yeah, mean, that was pretty cool. Yeah, it was cool. really nice. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, it's, it's nice when you spent a while away from home, you can kind of appreciate the things that I feel like maybe you don't necessarily appreciate when you're just going through the motions of doing them year after year or day after day. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Man, when I, when I get back to my parents house in Michigan after a long stay abroad you know especially in 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 Asia we were in China and Indonesia I get home and I'm like I could drink the tap water yeah. and flush the toilet paper this is unreal <laughs> it's the little things <laughs> and like yeah, exactly it is the little and things people actually wait at a red light well in Detroit I don't know not so much but in the, in the <laughs> suburb where my parents live people do wait at the red light uh, so that's nice. But then I guess we always, after being home for like a few weeks, we just like miss eating street food. That's not like dirty water, hot dogs. And we just miss, you know, cheap living. And I don't know, you know, the, the exotic, I guess you miss it real fast. So that I guess every time we go home, it's very nice up to a point, And then we start getting on our computers and looking at wiki travel and lonely planet. And we start listening to podcasts <laughs> We start getting itchy feet. We're like, we got to get out of here. Those itchy feet kick in, and then we we got to get out. Um, It's great to be home. We just don't really see ourselves living in the U.S. anytime soon. We like doing what we do too much to settle down somewhere. and We don't own any furniture or cars, so that makes life really hard in the U.S. It does. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We can relate to that as well. We had this moment the other night. We were talking to a friend, and... uh, just about what you were saying. Once you get to this point where you kind of have the ability to make some income, no matter where you are, you start just getting on maps every once in a while. And you're like, oh, we could go here. So we've talked about going to Mexico next winter, but occasionally we'll be having conversations. Yeah. Like, we could go to Croatia, Eastern Europe. Like, what about like the Ukraine? Or like, yeah. we could go to Bali. What about Chiang Mai? I don't I think the have, Ukraine came up in that, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, why not? I mean, it's just never been a better time to be able to do these things. It's, if I well, 10 year ago me, what current me would be doing, I'd say, get out of here. You know, there's no way you're still doing this. You're going to you're going to teach English for two years and go home and, and get a real job and stuff, you know. And no, man, you don't you don't need to do that these days. It's so much easier. It's it's unimaginable to, you know, just people of a, a few years ago. Right. That you can bounce around the world and do Airbnb stays in apartments and uh you know, get paid to study in Bali and you can even do house sitting, do house sitting and, you know, start a podcast, start a blog, teach Chinese kids English online from Mexico. I yeah. mean, there's <laughs> an insane amount of ways to craft a lifestyle of travel and, you know, adventure if, if that's what you want. And it's not for everybody. And I know a lot of people that I know wouldn't really enjoy what we do, you know, just like I, I wouldn't enjoy what, you know, a lot of people do at home. I don't know. It's, it's not for everyone, either situation. Yeah, yeah definitely. So you mentioned that you teach English online. Uh, what company do you guys teach for? It's called VIP Kid, uh, and it's a Beijing-based company. Um, they got started in 2013, and, and they've been trying to grow a lot for the last year and a half or so, and they have. They have grown a lot. They've recently reached 10,000 teachers and even more students. Well, yeah. Um, I'm not sure of the exact number of students, but they recently announced that they now have 10,000 teachers. Um, and so the kids are anywhere from 5 to 12 years old, and all the classes are one-on-one. 
and the company makes all of the lessons as PowerPoints, so you don't even have to do any prep work or any grading outside of class. You go in the classroom, load up the PowerPoint, and teach the class for 25 minutes, and that's it. Yeah, that's amazing. We actually interviewed uh, two other people who also work for VIP Kid. That's why I asked. I was like, oh, it sounds like the same thing that uh, their, their names are Matt and Marilyn. They have a podcast called Words with Winos. Oh, we know about the Words with Winos. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've listened to a few we're of their episodes. We're familiar with so. them. <laughs> we listen to that podcast as well. I told you guys we were, we were getting super into podcasts, especially the travel ones. So both, both the years came up. So we've actually talked to them because I heard their story, I think, on your podcast. And I had to contact them and I said, yo, do you guys work for VIP Kid? And they <laughs> yeah. said, yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. You said the exact same thing when we listened to that episode. Yeah, so that's pretty funny. There's there's a there's quite a we few are companies. Everywhere. Yeah, there's there's a few <laughs> companies doing it. Um, VIP Kid is not the only one. They have a lot of spin offs. China Chinese people are great at copying each other or other people. So <laughs> as soon as something's successful, there's a carbon copy of it. You know, there's there's quite a few. But VIP Kid is is awesome. Rachel did it for six months, which is they do six months contracts. So I told her if it goes well. And, you know, we're getting down near the end of our time in the U.S. and we're trying to transition to Latin America. Whoa, lots of fireworks. <laughs> Speaking of Latin America, there it is right outside my window. Um, I said, if, if you like it, if you like it and we're going to move, then I'll sign up. So I'm about to finish my first contract at the end of May. And it's it's pretty awesome. I really I really enjoy it. I'm actually. starting my third contract yeah. at the beginning of May. That's great. It's, it's so you, a really great job. It really allows us so much flexibility to move around as we wish. That's why we're able to just be in Mexico now. We finally got to a point in the U.S. where we were like, okay, what are we doing next? <laughs> we need to either like get jobs here or move on. And neither of us really wanted to get jobs there. So we were like, why don't we just go to Mexico? I mean, it's right there. Right. Why not? Inauguration day was fast approaching, and we didn't really have money for a flight. So <laughs> Mexico, Mexico at we also really enjoy traveling by bus. Yeah. And so we were able to travel essentially by bus all the way from my hometown in East Tennessee down to, to Monterey, Monterey Mexico. Mexico, which was really cool. Oh, cool. We stopped in. Atlanta and New Orleans on the way and Austin. and Austin and New Orleans and Austin were both new cities for us. So that was also really exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that I know like in the States too, bus travel is really affordable now. We had a friend come visit us from Atlanta and she actually took the bus all the way from there to Western Canada and her bus ride, she wow. took a bus from Atlanta <laughs> to Minnesota and that bus was cheaper than the bus from Calgary to Banff, Alberta, which is like an hour bus ride to Canada. <laughs> wow. I mean, wow, that is yeah. a long bus ride. <laughs> Especially with Mega Bus, if you can buy the tickets early, you can get super cheap tickets. But um, something that I'll, I have to mention, because we've, we've realized this since we moved to Mexico and we've taken quite a few long distance buses here, yeah? Mm -hmm. The buses in Mexico are so nice. When I get on them, I'm like, man. When I go back to the U.S. and ride a Greyhound, I'm going to feel like I'm in a third world country. For real. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, we've had that just from traveling South America. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, we had the same experience in South America where you can get the, they call them like full camera, where it's like you have a, essentially a large lazy boy that will fully recline and there's meals they bring you. One of them actually like served wine on board and you have movies. Um, and, and then you, yeah, you go back to a Greyhound and you're like, what on earth is this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is going on this here? This is the developed world? Yeah. Are we sure about that, guys? <laughs> um, so how did you guys, so you, you kind of hinted at just like, oh, Mexico's close, Mexico's cool. Um, is that really what led you to pick Mexico or had you been interested in going somewhere in Latin America before that? Yeah, well, we wanted to do just the big Latin American great Latin American road trip, I guess we'll call it, um, see as much as, as we can. And since we didn't really have concrete plans or really, we really didn't have the savings a few months ago to like go buying a ticket straight to Rio or Buenos Aires. It's, that's quite expensive from, you know, Tennessee or North Carolina where we were. So we thought, hey, let's go to Mexico first and spend some time there and we'll just kind of mosey our way down and we might not go everywhere, and uh, we might stay in some places longer than we expected. We might leave some places earlier, trying to be flexible. And I guess we got to Puerto Vallarta here, 
planning on staying only a month, really like it. Our place is super cheap. We have the space to work. And so we, we just kind of decided we should stay put for a few months um, since we have been moving around like crazy the last few years, really. Right. And, uh, yeah. you know, we can work here, live cheaply, uh, trying to learn some Spanish. Not so successful thus far, but we've been keeping ourselves busy with other things. I'm sure, as you guys know, you need to be all into a language or you're really not going to learn it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so has life in Mexico lived up to like expectations you had beforehand about it? Um, I think so. I think it probably exceeded those expectations, although I didn't really have super high expectations to begin with. Well, I... if you watch the news in the U.S., your expectations of travel in Mexico is that you're going to come home <laughs> yeah. chopped up in a bag, you know. Decapitated. <laughs> So I guess the fact that we're still alive has exceeded yeah. <laughs> most Americans' expectations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Single-digit b- bullet wounds. Our trip got closer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As our trip got closer and closer, all of our friends and family are like, you're going where? You're going to Mexico? Are you sure you want to do that? You know it's dangerous there. <laughs> and at first we were like, oh, yeah, whatever. Like, don't believe everything you see on TV. It's fine. But eventually, like, all of that, all of that kind of starts to get into your head and you start to kind of like worry about it. And by the time we actually got to the border, we were actually like a little nervous because even our bus driver that, uh, that we took the bus from Austin, when he checked our tickets and saw we were going to Monterey, he was like, are you guys sure you want to go there? I've been, lived in America for 40 years and I've never gone back to Mexico. <laughs> he, told, he told us to hide our money and yeah, stuff. He told us we were to like hide freaking our money, us out. But it was fine. <laughs> like it was totally fine. In fact, it's one of the easiest border crossings that we've ever done. The, the, the border officials like joked with us, gave us some of their dinner, uh, gave us six months <laughs> without any questions. They were just like super casual. Super friendly, friendly guys. They were watching like the NFL playoffs yeah. and you know, like it was fine. There was absolutely nothing to be worried about. It's been cool. I mean, we, we did three weeks of travel before we got to Puerto Vallarta. So we did Monterrey, Mexico City, and Guadalajara, the three biggest cities, and then San Miguel de Allende and Guanajuato, which are two really popular places, um, smaller colonial-style towns. A lot of expats live in, and they're just beautiful places. And then we went to Mazatlan for Carnival. We wanted to be in Rio, but like I said, we couldn't really afford to swing that. So Mexico has a huge Carnival, too, that's not really that well-known. It's actually the third biggest Carnival. Behind so, Rio and New Orleans. I guess Oh wow! it's been really cool because Mexico is a really nice mix of like comforts from home. I mean, for us, Mexican food is comfort food. Yeah, we'll never you know? get tired of Mexican Never food. get sick of it. Um, people don't stare at us and take photos of us like they would do in China or <laughs> Java. Um, so we blend in a bit more here. Blend, which yeah, is nice. you're just kind of like whatever. You're another gringo here. I mean, you're, you're nothing special. We got a bunch of you and... Just generally, people are, are nice. You know, people, people are really always friendly. say the buenas tardes and como esta, and you know, food's <laughs> great. Puerto Vallarta is beautiful. I mean, it is. In nice. many ways, it's easier than Asia. It's much easier. <laughs> so, so I would say, in that regard, as far as what I'm used to, it certainly, it definitely exceeded our expectations for sure. For sure, but you know, we're already like thinking about doing other travels. We always get the itchy feet pretty quick and. We would honestly probably be like in Guatemala by now, but with the VIP kid jobs, we really need a good, fast, reliable internet connection that, you know, doesn't cut out. If it cuts out, you lose the class, you lose the money, and you maybe lose a student. So you really have to be careful about where you set up shop with this job. It's not like my blogging gig where if the internet cuts out, I can put it away and wait till later to post. It's not a big deal, you know? It's location independence with a caveat. It's got big caveat. It's you know, we can't really be in Lake Atitlan, Guatemala. I looked it up. Most people who lived there or have lived there said, this will not work for your teaching job. It'll cut out. It's not a good idea. So we're kind of like basing down here and trying to plan, I guess, one to two week, maybe even a month long trips to some Central and South American countries and scheduling classes around that where we can pull that off. So that's the next goal. Yeah, yeah, I think that we can, well, we def- we definitely can relate to that because the jobs that we do outside of podcasting also rely us rely on us having good internet. Like we, we do 
calls with people back in the US and it's really not professional for our internet to cut out or for the connection to be bad. It kind of ruins the entire point of what we do. And I remember talking to Matt and Marilyn about that too. I think that it's really interesting when you transition into like digital nomad life or being location independent and I think people imagine that you can just work from absolutely anywhere in the world. And I think that with the way the world is in 2017, there are so many amazing places you can work from. But having good internet, I think, is so key for a lot of those jobs, uh, which can kind of make you feel like, oh, I actually can't go everywhere. I'm kind of limited. I think I I told Rachel the other day, I was like, if I see one more picture of someone with a laptop on a beach and the caption is like, work from anywhere, I earn money from the beach, I want to punch them because no, you probably don't. You didn't really have an internet connection there, you know, (laughs) like it's, it's possible, but in a lot of instances, it really doesn't work out that way. It's not that picture perfect. And then your, yeah, your laptop, the metal case on your MacBook's gotten too hot. It's like burning your skin. And then <laughs> right. you've got like sand inside yeah, of it exactly. like two weeks later and your laptop stopped working. Yeah, no, working, working from a beach is not all it's cracked up to be. Um, it's a very unrealistic uh, meme that seems to get spread around the travel blogging world. Yeah, I actually follow a travel blogger who the other day she posted a photo and it was like, I think it was her with her laptop sitting on a beach chair and she wrote a caption about how like, you know, everyone thinks that the, that this is what my life is like. She's like, in reality, I can maybe do this for five yeah. minutes before, you know, my laptop gets too hot. It's like, you know, killing my eyes <laughs> because you can't really wear polarized sunglasses and stare at a laptop screen because you can't see anything. It completely <laughs> distorts mm-hmm. it. She's like, or my laptop runs out of battery and there's nowhere to plug it in. Uh, like just yeah. kind of this like, reality of like this is what it looks like this is what it's pictured like on instagram but it's totally actually not like this <laughs> i like that see i like that you, you gotta you gotta yeah. pull the curtain sometimes and show what it's really like you know yeah definitely but there are awesome places you can you can live that lifestyle from so you know we, we have some other places on our short list i guess medi in colombia a lot of people who are in the know would probably not be surprised to hear that's high on our list and um I guess we've heard that a lot of places in Costa Rica, especially the bigger towns and cities, we could probably find good enough internet to keep the job. So uh, in the meantime, we're more than happy to live in a $200 a month furnished apartment with fast Wi-Fi and Netflix in Puerto Vallarta. It's not really a bad place to be stuck. I I like Costa Vallarta a lot. It's great. Yeah, Yeah. I think so. people... uh, our only really knowledge of it is from the vacation resort side. What's it like to actually be based there and living there? Well, a lot of fireworks, as you can hear, and uh, barking dogs and pigeons <laughs> living on your roof. Uh, it, it has a lot of similarities to Asia, actually. Um, at least in our local, super local neighborhood. We're in like a working middle class neighborhood where it's mostly, what, we're in a six unit apartment. Um, so... You know, it's it's definitely not the fancy side of, of Puerto Vallarta, but we, we find a lot of similarities to like our life in Kunming living in this neighborhood, just in terms of the apartment, the way the neighborhood's set up. Right? We live right across the street from a park where, like we mentioned, they have the Zuma class every day, and there's always like the local high school kids dance teams and like gymnastics groups that are practicing outside. I get to see them doing their cool backflips and stuff, and there's really amazing street tacos on every corner and it's really nice i really enjoy it a lot and we're like a 10 minute walk like a 10 minute walk from a bigger town that's like super traditional town it's centered around the square and the church it's you know all mom and pop shops and restaurants cobblestone streets cobblestone streets and so you can walk up there and it's a slightly bigger town kind of feel or we can catch the bus from our park and be downtown and, you know, the kind of happening area near the beach in 20 minutes, Mm -hmm. or we could walk towards the resort area and and their beaches in about 30. So we like our spot here. We're super local where it's really cheap to live. We have all the amenities we need and we have access to the, you know, traditional town, the, um, the beach, the downtown area, um, easy to the airport and bus station. So it's a really nice setup. Um, We're forced to use the little bit of Spanish we do have because it's such a local hood. But I guess we've been kind of pleasantly surprised. I didn't really think we'd end up staying this long. And we're already talking about just keeping this apartment until the end of the year because it is so cheap. Even if we spend two two or three weeks of the month traveling, we're getting our money's worth by having a base, you know? 
Yeah, definitely. That's that's awesome to hear. I think that that intrigues both of us for sure. <laughs> if there's one thing that I've learned, because at this point I've done both. I've lived in Beijing and done a lot of like short trips and I've done the full on gap year where I'm packing up my backpack every time we go somewhere with everything that I have with me. And to be honest, I like having a mix of both. I like having the freedom to go travel when I want to, but I like having a base to come back to because some like it's exhausting moving around every you know five to seven days when you're backpacking or even every month it gets tiring and it's really nice to have your comfort zone and your own space to go back to where you can kind of like recharge before you get back out there even if it's full of fireworks and barking dogs it's still a comfort zone exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's awesome <laughs> yeah, we definitely we haven't so on this trip in asia we've done a lot of that moving around and uh that's something we've been craving more so too the, like a place to kind of consistently return home to for a while so i think that's the direction we're moving in as well like booking somewhere longer term and then doing a bit of travel from there and then moving that hub somewhere else and then continuing to travel like that yeah i think that's our plan for now yeah i mean it, it is a good way to do it i guess after you know we did the long gap year and then we were pretty settled for a year and in- and then pretty settled for a year in Bali, and then we were the rest of the year in the U.S., so I just got really bad itchy feet. I just felt like we, we, we run a travel blog, and we, we're not traveling. Like We need to go check some countries off the list. We need to fill up this passport. It's going to expire next year, and I got really, I guess, pushy with myself about doing that until I got here and realized, hey, like you're in Mexico. You're living in a foreign country. You're, you're learning Spanish. You're you're, you're, you're having these experiences. You don't have to like rush to Guatemala just because you feel the urge to start checking other places off and seeing, seeing new places. Like it's not bad to, to slow down a bit and enjoy your surroundings, right? And get to know a place. And then because of the freedom of the job we have, right? We could schedule classes where we could go, go to Guatemala for nine or 10 days and not have to worry about anything. So what's wrong with that, right? That, that's a pretty good setup. It just requires a little bit more planning. Yeah, I think we can both relate to that, especially Ryan took a job in Atlanta for 10 months. And so this is like technically international because we're Canadian, but at the same time, it's like, it's the US. It's it's hardly international. And I was getting such itchy feet at the end of that. I was like, you know, we run a podcast and a blog called The World Wanders and <laughs> we, we are, are in, in the southern US. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, we still got some good material, like doing road trips and and that sort of thing like it's it was still good but it's like you know it doesn't really feel super exotic i'm like i don't really feel like a world wanderer right now i kind of feel like i'm just having this experience in the u.s so we can definitely relate to that yeah i mean if you guys are really thinking about mexico so far we've had an awesome time i mean we're seriously gonna extend the apartment at least till the end of the year so so far so good for us and uh I guess if you're looking, and there's a lot of good choices, but we're, as far as we're concerned, we're really happy with our choice of Puerto Vallarta. We were looking at like Cancun or Playa del Carmen because they're, you know, you have the beach, you have the infrastructure. In Playa del Carmen, you actually have more of a digital nomad community. Yeah, it's not so present here, but we're really happy with this choice. Puerto Vallarta is more old school Mexican. Uh, it's it's touristy, but not overwhelmingly so. It's I'd say mostly just in the resorts and like. Even downtown, it's touristy, but a lot of the tourists are Mexican, yeah. so it's you, you you still get a very Mexican feel here, and you get the beach, which Rachel loves. So <laughs> I don't feel like it's as yeah. touristy as the south of Bali, for example. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear. Um, yeah, cool. I think we were already kind of sold on Mexico, and I feel like that kind of confirms it for us. I've been trying to hype up Puerto Vallarta as a as a digital nomad spot because the infrastructure is slowly coming along. Like we have decent enough internet to both be teaching video classes at the same time. And we're supposed to be getting fiber optic pretty soon. And right. there's a lot of spaces here that could be co-working spaces. A lot of so. good cafes and restaurants and bars and beaches and surf towns and yeah. an airport and a bus station. It'll get you anywhere else you need to be. So it is, it, it checks all the boxes, I guess. People, myself included, have always looked at it more of, Oh, it's a touristy place. 
uh, oh, it's a it's a retiree place or it's uh, uh, it's a gay spring break. I mean, it's like the three main things that <laughs> think of our day. It is all those things, uh, but it's whatever you want it to but be. But it yeah, it's definitely whatever you want it to be, and uh, well, I guess we're kind of stoked to be uh, paving the blazing the trail for digital nomads in Puerto Vallarta. Everybody yeah. else should <laughs> check it out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I love that. Uh, so we want to be mindful of your time, but where can people go to learn more about you guys, read your posts, what you guys do, etc.? We have a blog called uh, GratefulGypsies.com. Um, we're also Grateful Gypsies on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, Snapchat. Snapchat, Pinterest. We're all over the place. Rachel loves the social media. I'm all about those social media can- <laughs> channels. awesome so everyone should go check them out follow along so yeah grateful gypsies is pretty pretty much it's a mixed bag of advice and tips for living abroad mostly in china related to teaching english we have some posts about the program in bali and life there you know the ceremonies the holidays all the cool experiences we had there Uh, and then we have a lot about long-term travel planning budgeting my real calling was to be an accountant, Rachel always says, so I'm, I'm actually pretty good at the financial <laughs> side of travels, and we, we cover a little bit of that. And then um, I We guess, just launched an ebook. Right. The other, yeah, we launched an ebook about budgeting in Southeast Asia. And then the other third is just you know live music. That's a passion of ours, and we love traveling for live music, so we share tales of festivals and concerts. And uh, it is travel, but it's a, it's a niche area, you know, traveling for shows. So we kind of touch on all three of those. People always say you should find a niche, but we don't have one. We're kind of a mixed bag. Yeah, we don't really live a niche life, so (laughs) we do a bit of everything. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing wrong with that. Amazing. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having us. Yeah, and if you guys make it down here, uh, I always tell people, first taco and tequila is on me, so I'll I'll, uh, hold my (laughs) promise if you make it here. To find more information, relevant links, and photos talked about in this week's episode, check out theworldwanderers.com. If you have a question, comment, or feedback, send us an email at info at theworldwanderers.com. Join our community on Facebook at The World Wanderers or on Twitter at World Wanderers 1. As always, thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.